today's scripture reading or today's message. I want to thank Clint and Allison and the band for leading us in worship. I want to thank Zhenya and Mark and Kat and all of our other speakers. And this is the third microphone headset to die today. Uh, Paul, in the booth, if you would do me a favor and run me down a handheld microphone, I'll use that for the service. So uh, I'll stall here while we do that. But if y'all could run me down a handheld, let's do that so we don't just infuriate everybody during the whole service. Uh, everyone, so... Uh, I, speaking of, I just want to recap really quickly last week's message. I hope you had a wonderful Memorial Day. And one of the things that was possible for us on Memorial Day was to hang out with some friends of ours who live in the neighborhood and to hang out on a Sunday night. Uh, no, it's the headset. It's not the pack. So um, this the handheld will be fine. And we were talking, and last Sunday was Trinity Sunday. And for those of you who aren't familiar, it's, a, it's Trinity Sunday. It's, it's a message that's always about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And one of the things that my friends who are preachers know about me is that I really struggle with Trinity Sunday sermons. I'm like Lucy in the football. Just Trinity Sunday never works out for me. The hardest I try. And so my friends who were over on Sunday night, they came and they were like, hey, how did the Trinity Sunday sermon go? I know you have a lot of anxiety about the Trinity Sunday sermon and whether it's going to sound any good or how it'll go. And I said, you know what? I actually think it went pretty well. And my wife went, hmm. <laughs> I was like, I was like, no, I think it went pretty good. And she goes, hmm. And I was like, so what's the hmm about? And she goes, well, Lance, it was Trinity Sunday. It was a Sunday all about threes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all about threes. Welcome to the gathering. Check one, two. She said, Lance, it was Trinity Sunday. It was a sermon all about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It was a sermon all about threes. You pointed out threes in the sanctuary. You talked about threes, etc. It was Trinity Sunday. It was a sermon all about threes. And you had two points. <laughs> and she said, you better start next Sunday explaining yourself. Uh, and the answer is, I'm just not that great. Welcome. Welcome. I'm doing my best. Uh, everyone, I'm Lance. I'm glad that you're here. And I was thinking for reasons that will become more clear over the course of this next week, I was thinking this week about people who've made a difference in my life, about people who have positively impacted me, who've, uh, who, who've, you know, whose impact on me sticks with me over the course of years later. And I thought this week uh, about a man named Reiner Ullier. It's a German name. He grew up in Ingolstadt, Germany. His name's Reiner Ullier. And I was thinking about Reiner. And Reiner came into my life at a very specific time. He was my select travel team soccer coach when I played select tra uh, travel soccer in junior high and high school. And he was such a meaningful and impactful uh, person in my life for reasons that had very little to actually do with soccer. I don't know how y'all made the transition from elementary school into junior high, but for me, that transition was not great. Did not handle that transition very well. All of a sudden, when I was in fourth and fifth grade, life seemed so predictable. I understood the world. I understood my place in it. And then sixth grade comes and just... I have, I have no self-confidence. I, I feel so awkward in my own body. Acne is setting in like a storm. My dad used to say jokingly, it looks like I had been hit with a track spike. Um, well, it, it's applied to him too. That's where I got it from. It's okay. You know, it was just so awkward. I mean, can you imagine a person who looks like me, but just looks like a baby fawn, right? In the world. In fact, you don't have to imagine. I brought a picture. I asked my mom, I was like, mom, can you find a can you find a, a goofy picture of me from sixth grade? And she was like, yeah, that's not going to be a problem. <laughs> I, was just an, I was just such a little simple kid. I was just so like, uh, worried about the world hurting me. I was just so self-conscious. And this guy, Reiner, my soccer coach, just made it so clear, just made it so clear that he believed in me. He just made it so clear that he saw something in me worth believing in. He just made it so clear through the way he treated me and the way he talked to me and the way he talked about me and the responsibilities that he gave me in our little world that he just saw something in me worth believing in. And I cannot emphasize enough in ways that had nothing to do with athletic skill. <laughs> he just believed in me. And he helped me start to believe in myself. He believed in me in a time when I desperately needed someone to help me believe in myself. And he made a difference. 
And you know, he did that in a way that my parents, you can take that picture of me down off the sanctuary screen, <laughs> by the way. Thank you all. You know, and my parents believed in me, but it didn't impact me in the same way because, you know, in my heart of hearts, I knew they would say that whether it was true or not, right? And my teachers believed in me, and that was great, but it wasn't true in the same way. It, it had to be someone like him to really make that impact, right? A person like him, a guy who was everything that I wanted to be at that point in my life, right? He was in his mid-20s. He was super great at soccer. He was cool. He looked like he fell out of the handsome tree and hit every branch on the way down. And for someone like that to look at me at that phase of my life and say, I believe in you, right? I believe in you. I believe there's something there. I believe you should have some confidence in yourself. I believe you should trust yourself. I believe in you, and I think you should believe in yourself too. Y'all, that stuck with me. 25 years later, when I'm walking around through the week trying to think of who's someone who's made a big difference in my life, he's one of those people, and I guarantee he had no idea he was doing it. He was just a guy in his 20s who was spending his time coaching a youth soccer team, 25 years later, I'm a grown man, and he made that kind of difference. And it had to be for a specific reason. I thought about why it was that he made such a big difference. And it's because of this. He was the kind of person I needed who gave me what I needed when I needed it. I needed someone who was in that phase. of. I needed a young man like that who had all these things I could look up to. It wasn't just my parents or a teacher. He was another trusted adult who gave me what I needed, right? A reason to believe in myself, a reason to believe that I was worthy or worthwhile or worth believing in, and he gave it to me when I needed it, right? That sixth grade moment, that seventh grade moment. He was my coach for a handful of years all throughout junior and junior high school and high school, in a time when I desperately needed someone to give me that message, right? He was the person I needed who gave me what I needed when I needed it. So if you'll indulge me in a transition, we're beginning a new sermon series this week called Googling Jesus. And it's fascinating because objectively, regardless of if you're a Christian or not a Christian, where I know every time we gather together, there's people who are with us who are very skeptical, who have a lot of questions, who are definitely not in on this whole faith thing. And if that's you, welcome. You are always welcome in this place, exactly as you are. And no matter where you are on the faith journey, it is 100% true, objectively, that Jesus is the most famous, most impactful person who's ever lived on the face of the planet. He's created more change. He's changed more lives. He's changed more societies. No matter where you are as a person of faith, objectively, he's the most impactful person who ever lived. This man who had no background, grew into a nothing family, came from a nothing place, right, has impacted the world more than anyone else who's ever lived. It's fascinating. And what's also true is that even though he's had all of that impact, even though he's made that kind of a difference, that there are still massive communities of people that have no idea who he is. Or even worse, have maybe heard a little bit about who he is, but that perspective has been so distorted or was, it was given to them uh, so ineffectually that they actually walked away with nothing. And it's fascinating because when you use the tools that are available to you to figure out what are people searching for on the internet, what is it that people want to know more about, what is it that people are looking for, one of the things that you can see really quickly is how much people are trying to find more information about Jesus. So that's what we're doing over the course of this sermon series, is we're Googling Jesus. And the wonderful thing is that for mo these most asked questions about Jesus online, we have the answers to them. So this first week, we're going to start with this first question. We're going to do like a who, what, when, where, why kind of approach. And this first question is this, who does Jesus say that he is? When people are Googling, this is what they're looking for. When you type in who and, you, and what are they looking for for Jesus, the question that people are asking is who does Jesus say that he is? So Jesus talks a lot about himself and about his mission, about the work that he's doing, about the way that he's changing the world, about how we're to believe in him and follow him and understand him. He does, it, he does a lot of teaching about himself and his purposes and what it means for us to be his followers. But what he also does, specifically in the Gospel of John, specifically in God's Gospel, is seven different times do what we call these I am statements. And you have a bookmark because that was going to be the sermon series that led us up to Easter in 2020. And I have to tell you, it went off without a hitch. <laughs> he does these I am statements. And the crowds hearing him originally, 
The people who were really well steeped in the Hebrew Bible would have understood that when he's doing that, he's actually mirroring God's revealing of God's self to Moses. This I am, I am who I am is what God says to Moses. So when he uses that I am sin structure, he's actually calling back to that. So seven times, of all the different things that we could look at over the course of the scriptures and who Jesus tells us who he is, I really want to focus on these I am statements. And Jinya read them off just in a list, kind of all together. They actually come from a lot of different portions of the Bible. And chances are, if you are a person who's been in church your whole life, you've heard these individually. We did just a couple weeks ago the uh, I am the true vine and you are the branches, etc. Maybe you've heard them individually or maybe you've heard them all strung together, right? These different I am sayings. But what you may not realize is that when Jesus is giving these answers, he's giving answers that are particularly oriented to the needs of the people who are standing in front of him. Does that make sense? When Jesus teaches about who he is, when Jesus reveals who he is, he is giving an answer specifically tailored to the needs of the people standing in front of him. Let's look at our first example, the first I am statement that Jesus says. He says, I am the bread of life. And when you read through the scriptures and we actually see that located in the midst of the scripture, the people that he's talking to are people that have experienced in his ministry just a few short days earlier the miracle of the replication of the loaves and fishes. They're people who have come to understand that from Jesus they can get nourishment, that from Jesus they can get sustenance, that from Jesus they can get fed, and they're hungry again, and Jesus will feed them again. But I need you to understand that he's speaking to people who are hungry and looking to be filled. And in speaking to those people, he says, what you need to know about me is that I am the bread of life. I am what you're looking for. You are hungry and looking to be filled literally and spiritually in this moment. And I am what you are looking for. When he's revealing himself to them, he's not just giving them an answer to a quiz. He's letting them know that he's what they're looking for. Our next example that comes up, I am the light of the world, he says. I am the light of the world, and the people that he's speaking to are in incredible darkness. He's saying, I am the light of the world, and he's speaking to people who are in incredible darkness, and the kind of darkness that they're in is not the kind of darkness that comes from being far from God or not being connected to God. It's the kind of darkness that comes when you are trying your best to follow God, but you have actually unintentionally headed in the wrong direction. The people that he's talking to in this context are deeply convicted religious people who have just nearly murdered a woman in the name of God. People that he's speaking to in that moment are people who are lost in the darkness of their own self-righteousness and have just nearly murdered a woman they thought to please God. When Jesus is letting them know, you are in the dark, he's also letting them know, I am the light that you are desperately searching for because you just keep going on your own farther and farther and farther away. I am what you're looking for. Our next answer that he gives, I am the gate. Again, speaking to a community of people who've dedicated so much of their life and their time and their energy and their understanding, trying to find their way into the promised land, trying to find their way into what it is to live in God's righteousness. He says, I am the gate. And he's speaking particularly to people who are desperately trying to find out how to enter into the kind of salvation that God is offering. He's saying he's the gate to people who are desperately looking for it. Our next example. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, he says, to a bunch of other shepherds who believe that it is much more likely part of their shepherd responsibility to murder and to kill than to sacrifice oneself. He's speaking to people who are shepherds themselves and who desperately need a better model. When he's revealing who he is, When he's revealing who he is, who does Jesus say that he is? When he's giving the answers, he's saying it specifically to the needs of the people who are standing in front of him. Our next one, which I think is going to be, I am the resurrection and the life. Not my first rodeo. When he says, I am the resurrection and the life, he's not just teaching a scripture study. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Lazarus' sisters. He's speaking to people who are standing there at the tomb of someone they love more than anyone else on the world and saying, how 
and why. Why would this happen to someone who loved God and did good and didn't deserve it? And how can this world be called good? How can God be called good if something like this is allowed to happen in God's world? And Jesus says to them, I am the resurrection and the life that you are looking for. What you desperately hope is just have your brother's death be reversed, and it will. But what you're actually looking for is proof that life springs eternal. And in me, I am showing you right here in front of you that you actually, finally, truly have it. When he's revealing who he is, he's revealing it to people who need exactly that. And finally, our last one. When Jesus points out that I'm the way, the truth, and the life, the second to last one. It's not my first rodeo. When he says, I'm the way and the truth and the life, again, he's speaking to people who are looking for this way. People who are deeply obsessed with trying to live in the Father's love. Trying to find out what it is to be loved by the Father, to do the works of the Father, to experience the love of the Father. And he says, if you want to know what the love of the Father looks like and feels like and is in your life, see me. See what I'm doing. See what I'm showing you. See what I'm revealing to you. If that's what you want, if that kind of relationship with God, if that kind of being understood by God, if that kind of peace and security is what you desire, I am showing you exactly what you need. And finally, when he says, I'm the vine and you are the branches, when he says, I am the vine and you are the branches, and if you stay connected to me, you will live, he's saying it at the Last Supper. He's saying it over the broken elements of communion. He's saying it hours before the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's saying it a day before the horror of the crucifixion and his death. He's saying it before all of the trials of those, his apostles, that we studied in just the last few weeks in the incredibly difficult journeys that their faithfulness will lead them on. He's speaking specifically to people who are afraid of living apart from Jesus, who've experienced so much of God's love and God's grace, God's presence and God's power, being connected to Jesus that they are terrified of losing him and seeing them, standing in front of them, knowing what they need. What Jesus tells them about himself is that I am the vine. I am the vine and you can and will live as my branches. And this thing that you desperately need is right here for you. Who does Jesus say that he is? Who does Jesus say that he is? Jesus stands in front of those people, telling them that he's the savior that they need, giving them what they need when they need it. And that's equally true for you today. That's the main point. Y'all, you know me. I'm not good enough to give a sermon and have you just like guess the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. This is the main idea here today, right? Jesus is literally standing in front of you in the same way that he's literally standing in front of everyone who experienced those words when he spoke them. He is present to you today, right now. And he is telling you that he is the Savior that you uniquely need with what you uniquely need as you need it in this moment. Jesus is standing in front of you telling you he's the savior you need, giving you what you need when you need it. Y'all can take that down. So I want to I want to pull your imagination a little bit this afternoon or this morning about what this means, about what it could look like for you, right? Because you probably didn't walk through the door today going, well, Lance, you know, I'm just uh, uniquely in need of a personal savior, I guess, and then brunch, you know, <laughs> and then I'm going to watch the Baku race. Don't spoil it for me. That's a joke for one person. Um, You probably didn't walk in the door today thinking, you know, these are my spiritual needs, and this is how they're unique to me, and this is how I need Jesus to uniquely meet me in that moment. You probably didn't think that when you walked in the door today, but it is 100% true. No matter who you are, whether you are just absolutely, you know, here to make somebody else happy this morning, or you are just barely kicking tires on this faith thing, or you are almost dropped off the ledge just hanging on with your fingertips to faith. Or whether you're rock solid, and this is an incredible part of the firm foundation of your life. No matter who you are, you have unique spiritual needs. And Jesus is here saying he meets them for you. Here's an exercise on how to figure out what your unique needs are. Let me ask you this. What's keeping you up at night? When you lay down, your head hits the pillow, and you could be going to sleep. You need to be resting 
it's too late, you stayed up watching too much TV, you're trying to catch up on everything you have to do, and you finally hit the pillow and you need to go to bed, but now you're thinking about what? What is it? What's running through your head? What's constantly on your to-do list? And why does it bother you so much? What are you afraid of losing? What are you afraid of failing at? What are you afraid that someone's going to find out? What is it that keeps you up all night? What is it that keeps you rehearsing what you should have said into the windshield of your car as you drive home over and over and over again? What's the fight that keeps coming up with the same person in the same way? Behind each and every one of those things is your need. That same thing is going to keep happening over and over and over again because at the heart of it, what it's really about is your need to feel like you belong. At the heart of it is your need to feel like if people actually understood me, if people actually saw me, if people actually knew me, they would still receive me. What's behind all of that and all the things that are keeping you up at night or making you feel like you can't get ahead or you're constantly afraid of being found out about is the need to feel like you're secure, like you're safe, like it's not all just a house of cards waiting to come tumbling down on your head. The thing behind the thing on all that stuff that's keeping you upset or that has you worried or that has you troubled or has you afraid that you're going to be found out is the desperate need to know that you matter, that you actually matter, that you're actually worth believing in. Each and every one of us in this room has something unique. Some of us are in the midst of the darkness. Some of us are looking for the gate. Some of us need the bread of life. Some of us are desperately needing to know that we can live connected to the vine. Some of us are looking for the way and the truth and some actual life. And Jesus is standing in front of each and every one of you saying, I am that person for you, giving you what you need as you need it today. And here's the good news. You don't have to believe me for nothing because you can talk to him about it. You don't have to believe me. I'm just a dude up here with too much blue on. You don't have to believe me. In fact, I suggest you don't. In fact, I suggest you talk to him about it. Because what Jesus promises to the community that hears him and to the community that comes, that he is the resurrected and living Christ. And for you in Tarrant County in the year 2021, he is here for you and with you and through you, just like he was to the people standing in front of him 2,000 years ago. He is telling you he is the Savior you need, offering exactly what you need as you need it today. So tell him. Tell him. Ask him. And experience actually being met where you are with what you need from who you need it from now and every day of your life. Let's pray. Great and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, great are you and greatly to be praised. Today, O Lord, we praise you for the presence of our Savior Christ. Jesus, the one who stands in front of people who are hungry and says, I am the nourishment that you're looking for. Who stands in front of people who are lost in darkness and says, I am the light that you're looking for. Who stands in front of people in desperate need of what it is to experience the love of God and says, I am the way and the truth and to experience that life you're looking for. Who speaks to people who are desperately afraid of being cut off from his love and grace and saying, I am the vine, the root that you are looking for. God, help us to search deep into our own hearts. Help us experience the truth of our own souls and help us to understand what it is that we are looking for. Help, it is, help us to understand our own needs so that we can see in Christ, our Savior, who has what we need when we need it. Jesus, it's in your holy name that together as your church, we pray the words that you taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
in the glory forever. Amen.